Shall we start, Dr. Fajr? Yeah, we can start. Okay. If everybody is here, we can start. Yeah, I think uh, there are already 30, 23 participants. Uh, people will join in the process. We can start now. Yeah. Already 10. Okay. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, so can you hear all... me clearly? Yes, yes. We can okay. hear you. Yeah. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, hope you all are doing well in this uh, pandemic or crisis situation. Today, uh, under Science Setu program, we are going to have a scientific lecture or a talk by Dr. Sayed M. Faisal, who is a scientist he at National Institute of Animal Biotechnology, Hyderabad. She'll be talking about vaccines, a journey from Jenner to genes. A brief introduction about Dr. Faisal. Uh, Dr. Faisal did his graduation, post-graduation and PhD from Alibar Muslim University, Alibar, India. Uh, right after PhD, he went to USA for a postdoc uh, at College of Veterinary Medicine, Cornell University, USA. He was there from 2005 to 2008. And in the same college, he joined as a research associate from 2008 to 2013. Uh, he was also a research scientist uh, at Carver College of Medicine for a few months, uh, University of Iowa, USA, before joining, to, before joining at NIB in March 2014. Dr. Faisal's research experience spans from immunology of genetic infections and development of vaccine adjuvants. His major research contribution has been in the identification and characterization of candidate antigens for development of subunit vaccines for leptospirosis and live alternated vaccines for the prevention of paratuberculosis. He has also developed some novel adjuvants capable of inducing both humoral and cell mediated immunity. His current research interests include understanding leptospira host interaction for developing effective vaccines and diagnostic tools, and also in development of novel vaccine adjuvants. He has published uh, several research articles in uh, international peer review journals. Uh, he has also received several awards, honors, and fellowships. To name a few, he has he is also a recipient of Ramalinga Swami Reentry Fellowship uh, from Department of Biotechnology Hyderabad. This is one of the prestigious uh, fellowships uh, given to an uh, extraordinary um, uh, person who want to come to come back to India. 
Uh, he has also received Edward Jenner uh, Vaccine Award in 2014 from the International Society of Vaccine, USA. Uh, he is also editor of uh, PLOS One and uh, Nature Scientific Report. He is also a member of international, several international uh, societies, including International Society for Vaccines, American Society for Microbiology, International Leptospirosis Society, and Federation of Clinical and Immunological Society. So without further delay, may I request uh, Dr. Faisal to uh, start his talk on vaccines, a journey from Jenner to genes. So thank you, Dr. Abhijit, for such a nice introduction. So I will share my slides now. So can everyone see the slides? Yes, yes. OK. So uh, good morning to all the students, teachers, my scientist colleagues, and all the past participants who are a part of the Science Center program. So today I am going to talk about uh, vaccines, which you all know that it is uh, one of the most uh, important medical intervention, and it has gained more importance and limelight in uh, in this uh, recent uh, in this, this current pandemic, the COVID-19, where a lot of vaccines have been developed in such a short timeline. So today I will take you through a journey uh, how the first vaccine was developed by English physician Edward Jenner and almost 200 years uh, back and how the technology has been improved and now what are the current vaccines we are having that are more refined, uh, more, uh, you know, uh, technologically advanced based on genes like we have a DNA vaccine and RNA vaccine. So according to World Health Organization, the two public health interventions that had the greatest impact on world's health are clean water and vaccines. So it is indeed very true that uh, once the availability of clean water was there, and when vaccine came into existence, a lot of infectious diseases, which used to cause, cause a lot of mortality and death around the world, have been significantly reduced. The burden has been reduced, and some of them have been also eradicated, like we can name a few, like smallpox and polio. And this is all because of vaccine. So vaccine, uh, the term vaccine is derived from Latin word vacca, which means a cow because the first vaccine was derived from a from virus infecting cow, which is called a cow box. I will tell you more detail about this in later on. So vaccine can be defined as a substance that teaches the body's immune system to recognize and protect against a disease caused by infectious agent. It could be a virus, it could be a bacterium or a parasite. So which is a substance which can teach the system, the body system to, to recognize and protect against that particular disease that is called a vaccine. A more technical term for a vaccine could be a preparation of a weakened or a killed pathogen, the pathogen which is weakened or a killed, such as bacterium or a virus or, or, or a part of pathogen. It could not be a killed or it could not be the whole pathogen, but a part of it, a portion of it that upon administration in the body induces an antibody response, production of antibody and cellular immunity against that the pathogen which can cause a disease. But vaccine itself is not able to cause a severe infection. So that is a technical term of a vaccine, that any preparation you make, which can induce a response and can protect against a disease, but itself is not causing any kind of a disease or a side effect. So if you go back to history, brief history of vaccine. So uh, this vaccine thing came uh, almost 200 years back when 1798, a landmark experiment was done by an English physician, his name was Edward Jenner. So he made a very interesting observation. He, saw, he found that the milkmaid who used to get milk from the cows, they uh, used to develop, develop a mild form of disease called a cowpox, where they, you can see the postules, uh, you know, having pus on the hands from which they take out the milk. But they, this is a very mild form of disease, but uh, naturally they are immune or they don't get in this uh, uh, smallpox, which was very much prevalent and very much severe disease at, at those times. A lot of death used to happen. So this was observation which was made by Edward Jenner. So he related that something is there in this uh, cowpox, which is naturally uh, protecting against the smallpox. So what he did is was that he took out the pus from the postules of this uh, uh, pus uh, from this, those, the milkmaid, whose name was Sarah Nems, and then injected this uh, pus into eight year old boy, whose name was James Phipps, and then intentionally gave the infection with the smallpox virus. That uh, the boy was uh, didn't get a disease, he was protected. And he, he never got a, get a disease. Uh, he was eight years old, old when he was got a vaccine, but he died at age of 20. But that was because of tuberculosis, another disease. So he was protected for almost all his like life 
so that was a very uh, you know uh, establishment or a kind of a you know foundation laid for a you know revolutionizing this vaccine technology or vaccine concept of vaccine so that's why uh, adver jenner is, is also called as father of immunology or vaccinology so almost 100 years later then a french scientist uh, uh, louis pasteur in 1885 he created first vaccine for rabies and anthrax uh, an american microbiologist morris r hillman uh he's he's having credit of creating more like uh, more than more vaccine than any any of the scientists has created he has almost developed almost 40 vaccines which most of them we use now like he's developed, developed vaccine for measles uh, mumps chicken pox hepatitis b pneumonia influenza hepatitis a and meningitis so he uh, he died in 2005 and uh, so he has a credit of creating lot of uh, vaccines uh, you know which ever any scientist has created so the period between 1950 to 1970 is considered as a golden age of vaccine technology because during this period a lot of vaccines has been developed against uh, many, of the, many of the infectious diseases so there are several diseases which can be prevented by vaccines but we i want to just uh, highlight a few which we get vaccine during our childhood and it could be very you know uh, you know lot of disease has uh, been you know the burden has been come down and they have been reduced like diphtheria we have you might have heard is very common disease diphtheria in kids children uh, whooping cough or pertussis and we have a smallpox which has been eradicated declared eradicated by who in 1977 then we have measles uh, tetanus we have tuberculosis and polio which has also uh, declared eradicated in 2012 however few cases of polio has been found in afghanistan and pakistan in 2018 <coughs> so Uh, if we go to types of vaccines so the vaccine first started with a you know very early at general time uh, with a you know the different virus was given uh, uh, and that to the concept of vaccine then you know people started killing the virus or bacteria the killed vaccine and then you know 100 years later you know the vaccine made by louis pasteur was a not a killed one but was weakened one you know attenuated vaccine so we have a killed vaccine or inactivated vaccine we have a live attenuated vaccine we have a subunit vaccine where we don't take the whole pathogen but take a part of it it could be a protein protein vaccine a dna a dna vaccine or or, or a rna vaccine then we have a toxicide vaccine which is based on toxins which are produced by the pathogen then we have a combination vaccines uh, where where uh, more than one or two vaccines are combined together and give a single shot we have a conjugate vaccine and we also have a edible vaccine i will tell you a little bit detail about all these vaccines in my subsequent slides So if you go to the kill vaccine, so basically the kill vaccine, as the name indicates, the bacteria or a virus is killed, and that is killing can be due to the heat or due to some chemicals like formaldehyde. So once the bacteria gets or virus get killed, it will not cause a disease. So but it will induce a response. It will stimulate the immune system in the same way as a live bacteria or or virus, you know, to generate response. So advantages of this kind of vaccine is that there is no risk for, of reversion to pathogenicity. So bacteria or virus once get killed, they can't uh, become alive. there's no way to become alive so there's no risk that they can cause a disease so they cannot become pathogenic there's no risk of transmission because they are already killed so they cannot transmit from one individual uh, to another individual and they also induce a strong antibody response however they also suffer from certain disadvantages like we did need to uh, give a booster doses for this kind of vaccines because they are already killed so they the antigen gets cleared and response goes down so we need to give a booster dose and there is a risk of infection because whatever method you use whether you use heat or chemical there could not be 100% killing there might be possibility that some bacteria or virus might remain alive and that may cause a disease so there this kind of vaccine always the risk is there that you will always see in this case cases some of the people have already got disease due to vaccine and that is because of this reason that some of the bacteria or virus remains alive so there is risk is there then these kind of vaccine also cause toxicity that could be local the area where you get injection and it, it could also be systemic in the whole body and there could be different kind of toxicity uh, and this is due to because we are using the whole pathogen that might be having some other components also and some vaccine component also that might be causing this toxicity and they induce mainly antibody response so antibody response means that there are two kind of response one is antibody response one is cellular response t cell response so these kind of vaccine mainly induce antibody response but sometimes uh, in some of the bacteria or uh, uh, pathogens where the, uh, the they live inside the cells the antibody may not be effective so you need a t cell response to kill the to kill those cells uh, by this cytotoxic t cells example of this kind of vaccine is like a, we have a polio uh, which is made by salk salk vaccine is inactivated polio vaccine and we have a vaccine for influenza 
Then if you come to attenuated vaccine, uh, these kind of vaccines are prepared when the virulent strains are grown under adverse condition. Adverse condition could be that you, you are growing the uh, bacteria or virus in a minimal media, you know, what they naturally take, the, you are giving just less amount of media or what a minimum media for survival. That may make them to change. And that change could be, you know, in a way that it becomes weakened. Or it could be passage through an unnatural host, normally where they infect, the infecting host, where they get the material for survival, therefore they are, you know, becoming stronger. You are putting them in some other host where which they normally don't infect. Those kind of things may cause them to become weak or attenuated. Uh, so that's, that is a way how we developed a attenuated vaccine by repeatedly, possibly, uh, you know, uh, passing them through, through minimal media or passing them to unnatural host. The advantage of this kind of vaccine is that they can induce both humoral and cell mediated immunity. So these kind of vaccines, since they are live, they can multiply. The bacteria of can multiply, they can, can, you know, make the copies, but they can't, can't cause a disease. So there is constant stimulation of immune system. So we the response can be for longer time. So there definitely there's no need to give any booster in these usually, you know, you booster is not required in most of the cases. And then also you expect when response is for longer time, then you can expect the protection will also for longer time. And these kind of vaccines can be given orally. Uh, you know, so like in contrast to the pill vaccine, this kind of vaccines you can give by through oral route, which is much easier route as compared to injection. And they also, uh, you know, are associated with low cost. They are more cost effective. However, there are certain disadvantages in this vaccine. They can always revert to virulent form. So the pathogen you have made weak uh, by putting in some unnatural condition or in minimal media, there is chance that this weakness is not permanent. They can always revert, for, you know, when they get, when they get the favorable condition, they can always revert back. They can again become stronger and they can cause a disease. So there's a reversion, there's a chance of reversion to virulent form. So there's a risk for infection. The risk is there, always there, that when, once they become a stronger, you know, the, the attenuation is gone, then they may cause a disease. And the one major challenge is that doing a controlled attenuation. Controlled attenuation means that you are making this, doing this process to make them weak. But if you make them too weak, then they may not be able to induce a strong immune response, optimal immune response. And if you make them less weak, then the chances that they may cause a disease. So this is the kind of balance, you know, where to see that attenuation should be controlled. You cannot make them more, more attenuated, or you cannot also make them less attenuated. So this becomes something very challenging in some of the cases. So this is one of the disadvantages of using this kind of vaccines. And being uh, they're also, uh, you know, this is a live vaccine, so they are also less stable. Example is that of uh, polio, which is salmon vaccine. We have MMR and we have BCG vaccine for, for Mycobacterium tuberculosis. So uh, realizing the uh, limitation of this, uh, uh, the since uh, live adrenal vaccines have been, you know, that can induce a long time immune response and have been considered very good, uh, you know, as compared to the killed one. But this limitation that of reversion to virulent form was a major limitation, which has, you know, some of the you know, cases they have prevented their use. So how to make them this attenuation or this uh, whatever you are taking weakening or the pathogen make it more permanent you know the water method we are using is not a permanent one they can always revert back but is there any method where we can make it more permanent you know so that they can never go once they are become attenuated they can never never go back to their original form you know pathogenic form so with the improved technology we have now uh, technology where we can make uh, these kind of vaccines uh, you know uh, you know these attenuated vaccines which are more permanent attenuation more stable vaccines uh, one way is that we can we can knock out the gene uh, which is involved uh, which is coding for a protein suppose the protein is a uh, gene is coding for a protein which a pathogen uses to attach to the host cell you know so this is a first step where pathogen wants to bind to the host cell to initiate infection if this step is blocked then the pathogen or binding is blocked so that a lot of pathogen uses surface proteins where which can be used, be used to attach to the host cell to initiate infection if you knock out the genes the pathogen will not be able to make those proteins. So it may inhibit the attachment and it may reduce the infection. Uh, and this pathogen may call it as an attenuated or a weakened pathogen because they are live, they are multiplying, but they are not able to cause a disease because if, if a basic, you know, important uh, gene is missing, which is coding for a very important protein which is involved in the uh, extracellular pathogen. But some pathogen live inside the cell, you know. So they're like, you know, some pathogen like mycobacterium, they live in the cells, you know, and there they take up the, they live in the cells and then they multiply and then they come out, uh, you know. So if you knock out the gene, which is involved in the survival of the, of the pathogen in the, inside the cells, like, you know, like I can give you example of mycobacterium. So they, they usually they require a amino acid called leucine and macrophages are deficient in leucine. So they have an enzyme, they have a, they have a gene which can code for enzyme which can involve in leucine biosynthesis. They can make the leucine, its own leucine 
for its survival in macrophages. But if you knock out that gene, then the macrobacterium cannot make a leucine and it cannot survive in the macrophages. Although bacteria is live, bacteria can survive outside the cells. You can culture it as a vaccine. They are live, they can multiply. But once they go inside, they will get killed. You know, they cannot survive. So, but they can induce immune response. So this is a, the pathogen is able to induce a response. So this is a more permanent attenuation and the several technologies are available. Like we can do through homologous recombination, inserting a gene through vector like virus, uh, where the gene is knocked out and, uh, you know, become non-functional. We also use a CRISPR-Cas9 technology uh, where we, you know, make this kind of mutation. I don't want to go into those technical details uh, in this talk, you can read further, but this is the way we make it, uh, you know, we use this technology and make it more permanent mutation and make a vaccine. Then we have a toxide vaccines. So uh, some bacteria, pathogen bacteria can release toxins. You have heard about like cholera, cholera bacteria, you know, it is toxins, uh, it is clostridium, tetanus bacteria, tetanus, tetani. So that is also released toxin, E. coli. So all those toxins are there which can cause damage to the host cells. So if you can neutralize this toxin, that could also prevent uh, the pathogen pathology or pathogenesis of bacteria or infection. So if so, so that people have exploited, they, what they have done is that they have, um, uh, converted this toxin to toxoid to make it, uh, you know, harmless. And that is done by using heat or chemical. So it, you know, the same toxin we purify and make it harmless and then use as a vaccine with some kind of adjuvant. So this kind of vaccine are safe, uh, you know, because uh, they are not, not, we are not using the whole pathogen, but a toxin, which is also made harmless. But the disadvantage is that they, this, for making this toxide vaccine, you need to cultivate the pathogen, the release toxin. That could be a, a, a risk in, is involved and uh, a cumbersome pause process is there. So that is a disadvantage. And then this kind of vaccine doesn't induce a long mm -hmm. immune response, long term immune response. So multiple doses required because toxic uh, thing is very cleared from the body very easily. And you need uh, to give the booster doses to maintain the immune response. So multiple doses required to get, a, get an optimum mm -hmm. immune response. And this kind of vaccine can also be, uh, you know, very, very expensive as compared to other kinds of vaccines. So that is certain disadvantage we need to overcome. Uh, but this is also one of the category of vaccines we are having for certain bacteria. An example is that we have a vaccine like tetanus, diphtheria, uh, which we call DPT. That is a toxoid vaccine. Then we come to subunit vaccine. So, uh, like we initially, the vaccine thing in field started with a killed vaccine, which, which had great success. Uh, you know, that even the killed vaccine eradicated a smallpox. And uh, then comes the attenuated vaccine where bacteria or virus have become uh, weak. weak. But realizing the limitations that they can cause some kind of toxicity or they, as a, they, they can cause disease, the technology has been improved where we, 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 we scientists have tried to find out the part of pathogen which can, which can be used, which can be more safe instead of using whole bacteria virus. We can use a part of pathogen which can use the same, which can induce the same level of immune response and induce protection as the whole bacteria. So that, that how the concept of subunit vaccine came, where we don't use the whole pathogen, but use a part of it. It could be a protein. You know, it could be a DNA or an RNA. Okay, protein uh, which we are using can be purified directly from the pathogen and use as a vaccine, or it can the gene coding for that protein can be cloned in a vector, expressed in E. coli, and a recombinant protein can be made, which can be used as a vaccine. Same way, the DNA, uh, you know, can be gene coding for that uh, particular protein can be cloned in vector and directly injected in the host, where protein is made in the host and induce immune response. Same way, with RNA also. Uh, we can use it uh, from DNA to like standard dogma says that DNA to makes RNA and RNA makes a protein. So we can take RNA, which can make a protein in the body and that protein will induce immune response. So that is the, whatever way you make it, you, you're not using the whole pathogen, but only a part of it. So first advantage is that this kind of vaccine is very safe. Definitely there's no risk involved because you're not using the whole pathogen. So you're just using a part of it. Then it has a defined composition. Like when you use a whole pathogen, pathogen has several proteins, several uh, molecules are there. You know, some might be inducing a response, some might be suppressing it. So it's very difficult to evaluate what, what is going on. But in this case, you have a defined composition. You know the response you are getting, whatever antibody response or diesel response you're getting, you are getting against a defined composition, which you already know, which is a protein, which you know. That is the advantage of using this kind of vaccine. Then this kind of vaccine can also be manipulated. You, you want, you can manipulate this thing, this kind of vaccines to induce a desired immune response. There are also certain disadvantages, like these kind of vaccines are less immunogenic, you know, that because you are, because the system, the immune system has been, uh, you know, ev through evolution, it has been developed in a way that it can recognize a foreign particle up to certain size or certain, uh, you know, uh, heterogeneity or whatever you call. So below that, it will not be able to recognize, you know, so that's what happens, smallest particle, 
which can be recognized by immune system is a virus, which is very small. But protein is much smaller than that. So if you if you inject a protein, it may not be able to activate the immune system as a whole bacterium or a virus. So that is the problem with the protein. So that they are, if you use a vaccine, they are usually less immunogenic. They cannot induce the same kind of response, strong response as we get from the whole bacteria or virus. So they, they require uh, additional component like adjuvants, which are immune boosters are required to so make them more immunogenic. You know, so antibody can be can be or T cell response can be enhanced. Then we also need a multiple dose because these are the vaccines uh, which are made of small component, which are then uh, which are very utilized and you get be degraded, cleared off on the body. Response may go down, so you need to have a to give an additional dose to maintain the response. And making this kind of vaccine is definitely expensive. You are you know you are not using the whole bacteria, just killing it normally, but you are purifying a certain component or through the complementary technology also you're making you know getting a protein. So this process could be you know also technically more difficult and could be also be more expensive. Uh, we have example of a subunit vaccine which is in market. We have a vaccine against hepatitis B, hepatitis B vaccine, where hepatitis B surface antigen, the antigen on the surface, is cloned, gene is cloned in a in a vector and purified in a yeast. So that uh, that is there, which is uh, you know, which is used as a subunit vaccine. Hello, Rashmi, I'm in talk. Hello, oh, I, I, I'm in doing talk. Okay, call it up. Yeah. Sorry. So, so right now we come to DNA vaccine. Uh, in DNA vaccine, you know, uh, you know, we the, what we do is that we we take a gene, we identify a protein. Suppose it is a viralist factor. It is important what we have done for protein. We don't take a protein, but we take a gene of that protein, which codes for the protein, and insert insert in a vector, plasmid vector. Okay, which can uh, cause expression of this gene to make a protein and inject the whole uh, construct in a in a body, in a human host, you know. And then what happens when this plasmid injected in the muscle? Muscle cells, uh, you know, may take up this plasmid. Maybe the myocytes or retinocytes, skin cells may take up this uh, plasmid, uh, you know. And then there might be some some immune cells like dendritic cells, macrophages are there in the muscles, which may take up this uh, plasmid, and then they express the protein. Uh, and uh, they express the protein. Protein is uh, processed. And presented by the, the MSC molecules uh, to present to the T cells and B cells. So then generate immune response. So protein, which is not made outside the body, but it is made it's inside the body by the cells. And this protein is then presented to the immune cells to induce immune response. Then we get how we get a uh, antibody are, are made in the then these cells from the muscles go to the lymph node, which is lymphoid organ, you know, place where a lot of immune cells are there. Antibodies are generated, uh, T cells are generated, where they circulate in the whole body and to induce a systemic immune, immune response. So this is how the DNA vaccine work, works, the uptake of DNA and then expressing protein inside the body by those specialized cells and then uh, inducing a response against that particular protein. So this kind of vaccine has certain advantages that plasmids are easily manufactured in large scale. You can, you know, as compared to protein, you know, plasmids are much easier to, to make. And DNA is very stable as when you compare to protein, you know, DNA is more stable. So you can store DNA. You don't need a very low temperature to store it. Uh, you know, they remain stable for longer time, even if, you know, normal temperature. And they can elicit both antibody as immune immunity. So, you know, this protein, what you're, you know, injecting, you know, it is going in the cell. So it is, uh, you know, I'm not covering that part, uh, you know, how it is giving this thing. But since the protein is expressed in the cell and the process and presented through both MSC1 and MSC2 molecule uh, and activating both CD4 and CD8 kind of T cells. So it, it is eliciting both antibody and cemetery immunity. So it is also inducing a long-term immunity because plasmids, once enter in the cell, uh, you know, it will keep on replicating, multiplying, making more proteins, you know, protein will constantly be made in the body. You don't need any kind of booster additional plasmid for it. Because when it is when it is when inside a cell, it will make its own copies, it will make the protein keep on making it for longer time. So you can get a long-term immunity. That's the advantage of this DNA vaccine. But they also suffer certain disadvantages, like this uh, the immune response is limited to the protein immunogen. What we have for protein vaccine, that means you are not having a response against the whole pathogen, but you are having a response against a certain protein which may you have selected. So maybe sometime a single protein uh, you know, uh, response may not be as effective as we get one from the whole bacteria virus, where response is against all the components of the pathogen. So that is the one advantage, although it is very safe, very defined, but you know, response may be limited to that protein. Then we know sometime what happens that, you know, because plasmid once it enters, it will keep on multiplying, it will be replicating, it will produce a protein. So there will be constant immunostimulation is already going on the, in the, at least, uh, at least the place where you injected in the muscles. So that could lead to the chronic inflammation, you know, and uh, that inflammation and pain. That could also be in some cases, 
this could become more very chronic and it could be one of, one of the disadvantage and since this plasmid you are you know cloning in a gene plasmid which has an antibiotic gene for resistance for selecting this plasmid so it has not been removed so that antibiotic resistance problem may also occur in the host when we use this kind of vaccines so these are the advantages we are having so all the dna vaccines are in early phase of clinical trials there no dna vaccine in the market uh, so human trial is going on for malaria aids influenza uh, ebola and herpes uh, it's already there then we come to the rna vaccine so rna vaccine work by introducing an mrna sequence but we told no dna dna we, we use a gene for dna vaccine gene makes mrna and then protein is formed but here we are skipping that part we directly coming to mrna so that we get a direct protein from mrna uh, which is messenger rna so there are different types of rna vaccine we can use a non replicating mrna simplest mrna which means mrna which you are taking you are having mrna which you can directly inject in the body uh you know taking some carrier molecule it would be a nanoparticle or liposome where you package the mrna and directly inject and it will be taken up by the cells and mrna will then you know will take, use the host machinery to express the protein and protein will form and presented by msc molecule the t cells and immune response will generate this is how you introduce the mrna and how the whole the process is taken care of by the cells and protein is formed peptides are formed and it is presented to msc molecule and immune response is generated so this is mr non replicating mrna you can also take a replicating mrna in vivo cell replicating mrna so in this case mrna in the non replicating one what mrna you are taking it expresses the protein make the protein then mrna is degraded job is done but in this case mrna also makes its own copies you know it has already had additional strands which can make uh, which has some enzymes are there which can make its own copies more mrna generated so that more proteins are generated more proteins are made but in other case non replicating one you know you, the only proteins which are made by those that rna which has been reduced because rna will not stay for longer time it will get degraded so when rna is gone you cannot get additional proteins okay so that is a in vivo cell replicating mrna then we also have a category of a mrna vaccine where we don't inject mrna in the body we don't give in the body host but you take out those cells which take up the mrna for instance we take out dendritic cells we take out in the body and then in the culture we infect we 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 transfect those mrna in the culture uh, to those dendritic cells we take up the mrna and once the dendritic cells taken up the mrna then we inject the same dendritic cell back to the person uh, as a vaccine so in this case we make sure that uh, you know because in body there is no control how much mrna will go and how much will degrade but in this course we have a control that we make sure that whatever cells we are injecting already have a mrna which will which will you know translate into protein and then immune response is generated this is another way of uh, you know uh, making mrna vaccine so we three categories non replicating mrna in vivo self replicating mrna and also in vitro dendritic cells non replicating mrna so the benefits of these vaccines are that they are very safe uh, they because we are not using the whole pathogen so they are non infectious they does not integrate in the host genome so you know you know like dna dna can integrate in the host genome okay but rna can't so they don't integrate in the host genome and they get degraded you know they get degraded so once they made the protein you know what kind of protein they made they get degraded then efficacy wise you can also we have seen that already trial is going on and you know we it has generated a reliable immune response and well tolerated and has a few few side effects which are normal to every vaccine so it has not much any major side effect looks like you know it is, a, it is promising efficacy wise and when you comes to production how these vaccines are made so this can be mrna can be rapidly produced in laboratory there is also very easy because they are very simple molecule they can be easily standardized and they can always be improved in responsiveness to especially in case of emerging outbreaks so these are the uh, key uh, benefits of using a mrna vaccine but as as uh, you know we have seen a further vaccine this vaccine also has certain disadvantages or limitations or challenges you can say this mrna could have uh, some unintended side effects you know and that could affect because it's a foreign rna you know so there could be uh, some autoimmunity or unintended uh, immunization could happen against this mrna which can be minimized if you design the sequences of mrna which is very close to the host immune cells like you know mrna so mimicking the mammalian cells so that can be designing can be done where you can want to just see that you may have to make sure that mrna makes a protein at the same time there should not be any kind of response generated by the host against this foreign mrna so and then delivery is also a challenge so delivery you know this mrna you should inject directly they are very unstable they degrade very easily that's why we package in the some part particles like liposomes or or like uh, nanoparticles so that itself is one thing you know which has you know becomes under challenging uh, and it comes under limitation 
then storage also that we know that dna is very stable but rna is not so rna you can't store outside normal temperature so it has to be refrigerated very low refrigeration is required for rna that is a limitation especially in transport to countries which don't have those facilities uh, in third world countries or poor countries so you know that you know then covid 19 the moderna vaccine or pfizer vaccine is a mrna based vaccine so you have seen that those vaccines requires uh, minus 80 or this kind of very high, low temperature refrigeration to keep them stable for longer time so clinical trials are ongoing for influenza cytomegalovirus hiv1 rabies zika virus and covid 19 for this rna vaccine then we come to combination vaccine so combination as as the term indicates combination means that you combining the vaccine so you you are not in giving single vaccine but you combine one or two vaccine together and then you know you intend that all vaccine will give a immune response and you get a protection against the same time you don't to come for additional shot so combining all to a single shot so we have a lot of vaccine already available in the market which again combination especially in children like pdrx which is protecting against five disease diphtheria tetanus pertussis uh, uh hepatitis b and polio we have uh, proquad uh, for measles mumps rubella and varicella we have ekinrix which is against four disease diphtheria tetanus pertussis and polio then we have pentacel which protects against five diseases diphtheria tetanus pertussis polio and hemophilus influenza type b so this uh, combination vaccine is mainly the benefit for children because you need a fewer shots for them giving a shots is is challenging always challenging for parents so you know a single shot you cover a lot of uh, diseases and then definitely when shot is less it will lead to less pain and discomfort and also it will lead to one time protection so this combination vaccine has advantage of you know in this particularly in case of children Then we come to conjugate vaccine. So conjugate vaccine, you know, certain bacteria have a polysaccharide coat outside the you know surface. So they have you know like a like polysaccharide sugar molecule is there, sugar coating is there. We have a, a lipopolysaccharide LPS molecule is there. You know, so antigen has two types. You know, we have antigen which is a, a protein antigen made of amino acids, but we also have an antigen of polysaccharide. You know, these are these are all the antigenic. They can also induce immune response. They can also generate an antibody. But problem with this kind of antigen is that they are not a protein so they cannot process by for, for by the cells to present to t cells so they are t independent antigen okay the antibody will be directly formed by b cells in recognized by b cells and they form the antibody t help is not required so since t help is not required the antibody form will be of low affinity they will be no like no class switching less class switching like from igm to igg class switching is required so that will also be not be will be very less low affinity antibody short term antibody will be there you know which will wane off with time and there will be no memory formed you know every response every immune response leads to memory you know cells there will be some cells which will be there which will left which will be you know uh, you know memory cells which can which are already exposed to the pathogen so when the pathogen comes they can again again bounce you know, induce the response at very rapid rate so that memory is not formed by polysaccharide vax, uh, polysaccharide uh, uh, antigens if you use a vaccine these are limitations we have you know uh, so to overcome this limitation this conjugate vaccine concept came up where if you link the polysaccharide to a protein carrier molecule then the cells the immune system will recognize this uh, this uh, whole uh, you know conjugate as a protein vaccine so it becomes a t dependent antigen so linking this outer coat to protein the immune system will recognize the polysaccharide as protein antigen become t independent so conjugate will become a t independent then antibody induced will be high affinity antibodies it will be a strong response and long term response you can see and also immunological memory can also be formed so the limitation even the polysaccharide is a, is a outer component it is a good antigenic component you know it can protect against the disease but the problem with that you can't use them as such to making vaccine because this limitations uh, so that can be overcome when you make as a conjugate when you put a carrier molecule protein molecule and then this limitation can be overcome so we have a conjugate vaccine available against hemophilus influenza b type b vaccine which is a conjugate vaccine then we come to edible vaccine so as the name indicates the vaccine you know which may be taken orally or it we can which we can eat so the prime minute to talk about edible thing edible thing then first question comes on our mind is that you know, can you know plants be of any utility in vaccine so that is something you know it is is hard to think about that how can you plant plant be related to vaccine animals we thought you know we use animal for making vaccine but how plant can be used so that is something we you know so this also is this concept is not very new although we don't have any edible vaccines but is all this edible vaccine is very old two decades back uh, this concept came and work is already ongoing uh, so this is just introduction of the desired gene uh, what we have seen you know, for the subunit vaccine which codes for a important uh, virulence factor that gene you introduce in the plant so instead of in the bacteria 
or you directly inject in a human as a DNA vaccine or you know you make this that protein in the plant okay that is the idea so that protein will be made by the plant a foreign protein for the particular pathogen will be made by the plant so how we do that we used to in uh, you know have a gene from the human pathogen that is inserted in the bacteria the bacteria should be a category which could infect the plant so we, we have, there are some bacteria which can infect the plant like we have agrobacterium purifaciens which can infect the plant there are certain virus also we can infect the plant like uh, tobacco mosaic virus is there so if you take a bacteria or virus which can infect the plant and introduce the gene then when this bacteria infects the plant like here they have shown the cartoon that uh, you know this gene introduced in the plasmid which introduced in the bacteria like agrobacterium then it is cultured with the leaf plant leaf and you know bacterium was already infected the plant and gene introduced in the plant plant grows and you know like this is a potato plant example so potato you you will have the that protein is already there foreign protein from the pathogen is already there in the potato when you eat raw potato it will trigger immune response so i understand that eating raw, raw potato will not be easy uh, you know no, you know don't like, like to but this is just a concept which is there so i will tell you more detail about this thing uh, so this is how it works okay so there are certain advantages of using this kind of vaccines first advantage is that you know everyone is scared of injection you know no one wants to take injection you know searing with needle so this kind of vaccines you know you can give it orally because you eat the you know the plant you eat whatever the fruit or vegetable you eat so you get a vaccine the oral administration is there then this kind of vaccine do not require a special storage condition you know you don't need to store in mass 20 mass 80 in very low uh, freezer uh, like other vaccines you do you know these are like plants which can be stored normally whatever they you know uh, potato need not to be stored in the freezer you know it, it can kept outside for a long time so that is a, that is an advantage it is very stable definitely is very cheap cheap you know because you're making in plant you are no, not using you know any kind of resource you know for making it plant is already growing what are you doing it is just making additional protein it's very cheap particularly for countries which cannot uh, which are poor countries so it can eliminate infection because possibility because there is no chance because you're not really using a pathogen the same way like for other subject vaccine this kind of vaccine also uh, there is no chance for infection it activates the mucosal immunity that is you know, mucosal immunity means the the immunity uh, you know immune, immune response generated in the area where the pathogen used to gain the entry in the body you know the mucosal surface you know if that area you get immunity the pathogen will not be able to enter in the body itself first place only you're blocking it so that is very important you are not allowing the pathogen to enter the body so that is uh, that can be immunity can be generated only uh, you know with this kind of vaccine the edible vaccine so this is uh, one of the advantage then this kind of vaccine is acceptable in poor and developing countries because you know that because it's plant based definitely it can be afforded you just need to grow the plants and you know eat it so that is there so it is acceptable however there are certain disadvantages like because this is a transgenic plant now you have introduced a foreign gene so this transgenic contamination can occur and you are also using antibiotic resistance marker for selection of those things. So, so antibiotic resistance problem will be there. And, and the major challenge in this kind of vaccine is difficulty in dose maintenance. That is one of the biggest challenge. Which people are, you know, you know, like you have got a vaccine for potato, but you can't evaluate. It's very difficult to evaluate how many potatoes you have to eat, uh, you know, to get an optimal immune response. And that is whether you have to eat one kg or five kg or 10 kg. That is something, you know, that is beyond a limit. So that is something which challenging. Said, so how can we make more protein, you know, more vaccine in a less amount of uh, plant? So that is something is there. So that is a challenging part, or you know, disadvantage of this kind of vaccines. So we have example, you know, where, where trial is going on where certain vaccines, like banana vaccine is there. Uh, so banana advantage is that in order to cooking, it is inexpensive. It is widely grown in countries, different different countries. And however, it has disadvantage that the trees take a long time to mature, and Banana, you all you know that it is it really spoils very rapidly after ripening, so you cannot store for a long time. So that is one of the disadvantage of having banana. If you want to use banana as a vaccine, then we have potato. Also, I already told, it can be easily transformed, it can be easily propagated, and can be stored for a long period without refrigeration. However, disadvantage is that you can't eat raw, raw potato. You have to cook it. So you need cooking. So which can denature the antigen. So whatever antigen you have, you know that with heat can denature it. So then immune response will not be generated or will not be effective. So that is a problem, uh, you know, when you use this thing. So every 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 uh, uh, this thing has a, some advantages and disadvantages. So you know, work is going on uh, to overcome this thing. So current status of edible vaccine is that the clinical trials for measles, cholera, foot mouth, mouth disease, and hepatitis is ongoing. There is a human trial on potato-based, uh, you know, uh, vaccine is going on for cholera and hepatitis B. And the trial have shown that antibodies were generated against cholera toxin and hepatitis B surface antigen. Was induced so that is the there but you know 
uh, this the challenges associated with this kind of vaccine can you can easily see that is not something which will come uh, out so uh, easily a lot of things has to be overcome uh, to make it materialize and the major challenge which we see in this category of vaccine is that resistance to genetic modified food so people are still very resistant they don't want to take a, take a genetic modified food we see you know we are going to more towards organic you know without any kind of modification so that will definitely affect the future of edible vaccine then we have a new term uh, this thing concept of reverse vaccinology which is you know which is not very recent but it has come up uh, you know and um, and i will tell you what is the reason why it has come up that we know that when we uh, when we you know the seminal vaccine is started uh, you know after the killed and pathogen killed and attenuated so this kind of vaccines you have to cultivate the microorganism and this cultivation of uh, microorganism is required and then you purify the protein test immunity and select the antigen you want to test uh, you know and then do testing you cannot test one antigen you have to test for a large number of any uh, antigen and which animal testing which is definitely a time consuming long process four to five years may take uh, and it is also very expensive because animal experiments are very expensive and very 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 tedious and not easy so those testing you know may take a lot of uh, time and uh, it's also a lot of cost involved and major challenge was that in certain microorganisms you can't culture very difficult to grow so if those organisms which you can't culture how can you make a vaccine for this for these organisms by this technology commercial technology so there is no way you, because you can't culture them so then this reverse vaccinology concept came up which is was uh, coined by dr rino ripoli who was a uh, italian scientist uh, he made the first vaccine against neisseria meningitis when we uh, so here what we did is that he just compared the genome of all the strains of the bacteria of that category you know all the strains compared the genomics to identify the common antigen and then using the computer software you know you can do that you know computational thing and they predict the proteins which are either surface protein or secretory proteins and then you go to the proteins which have the uh, good amount of very strong b cell epitope t cell epitopes you know which are likely to induce very good immune response those prediction can be made by different softwares which are available so you can do lot of this thing by computational thing which is much quicker doesn't require any cost uh, you know and then we, you can narrow down to very few protein which you think which which prediction shows that they are will be highly immunogenic and can be highly protective also so those proteins can be then uh, you know make as a recombinant protein and testing can be done first in vitro where we can check by reacting with the serum and then very testing very few protein in the in the animal for 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 immune response and efficacy so that timeline can be reduced to 1 to 2 years so that is the thing where you know reverse vaccinology concept has come up and that is advantage of having this kind of uh, you know now it started with men uh, this meningitis but now people are using this thing for a lot of other diseases also it's also they already a work is going on so how do vaccines work this question is that how do so technically vaccines uh, the way the vaccine work if i go to the more detail is more complicated how do they work but to make it very simple i want to make it very simple realizing that a lot of uh, students are there so when we give a vaccine uh, you know vaccine usually are given if you go to the human host they are given by intramuscular injection you know in the muscles so when they in the muscle when the vaccine the vaccine component or uh, antigen is taken up by the muscles the cells immune cells immune cells in the muscles macrophages dendritic cells are there they they uptake the antigen take the vaccine component and in the process of uptake they process the and they become activated they become mature you know uh, for presentation and this is called activation and migration they migrate to the lymph nodes lymph nodes which is called draining means the the, the nearest lymph, lymph node which is that site that is draining that area so that will go to the lymph node where we have immune cells b and t cells are there so these antigen are then presented to these cells b and t cells and then whole process starts of activation maturation and then production of antibodies which is like very like i don't want to go in that detail very complicated so simple down with just starts the lymph node and then they make a antibodies are formed by plasma cells b cells then we have certain toxic t cells the antibodies will identify the pathogen these cells are toxic t cells kill the infected cells uh, you know and then some small amount of cells will left which will form memory memory cells will form for future infection it's called a chronic expansion and immunological memory form with activation and migration and then the memory so it can be involved in a three category where first the uptake and then there is there that innate response is there and then there are two responses there and overall uh, this and these things which can protect with the subsequent infection now in this covid 19 we have heard a lot about the herd immunity uh, you know uh, this thing is came that what is herd immunity i want to cover that also so you know that a vaccine if you take a vaccine you know that 
you you it's, it's not that they, you guarantee that you will not get infection. Uh, if, if you take the vaccine, you will definitely get an infection by virus bacteria. But a, a, a surety or chances are very high that you will not get a severe disease. Hospitalized, you know that is there. Definitely, you are thinking that if you take vaccine, it is. Talk talk. Okay. So, uh, so if we, but the problem here is that everyone can't be vaccinated. If you go to, in a community, everyone they can't take a vaccine, and there are several reasons for this thing. The people with underlying health conditions, like they have someone is having a cancer or HIV, you cannot recommend him to take a vaccine. Person having a weak immunity, they are already on immunosuppressive drugs, so they will also avoid vaccine. And person, some people might be allergic to some vaccine components. They are the people who will be identified as person who can't take a vaccine. Then how will they get protected? So that's how the herd immunity concept comes up, where uh, you know, uh, uh, where you know that come, you know, we, when you communicate, when you uh, do a vaccination in a community, it protects the whole community, even those who can't take vaccine. Hello. Uh, I won't talk. Yes, I said talk. I did caught up later. Okay, so uh, like you protect the whole community, even who, those who can't take a vaccine. That is, a, and how it works. I just want to give you an example that if you know, if in a community there are individuals, and you you see that uh, you know there are few people vaccinated. The, in the blue thing you can see they are vaccinated, and the one in the gray are not vaccinated. Okay, and one person get infected in the community you know, when few are vaccinated, then this infection spreads very fast, and disease spreads very fast. You know because very few are vaccinated. But in, in the if you vaccinate a lot of people in a community, a lot of people vaccinated, even there are few which are not vaccinated. And if one person gets infect, infection, then this disease will not spread very fast. You know, it can't spread very far. That is the there. So that's how the hard immunity role plays a role. When you have already vaccinated a majority of people uh, in a population, it will protect uh, those people, a fraction of people who can't take a vaccine. That is what is, what is hard immunity. So how is vaccine developed? So that vaccine development process if you see that you know vaccine, it is two two step where it could be discovery. You what I mean from discovery is that uh, whenever you want to develop vaccine, a discovery could be a discovery of a target antigen which you want to use. What 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 thing you want to use? What thing we discovered? Suppose we discovered a, uh, a antigen from a pathogen which is having a very good uh, protection. That is that is there. So you already have a target, but you have to make a vaccine. You have design. You have to design, and you have to make some formulation, and then you uh, can test it. So designing part comes with that thing. When you design, make a formulation, then do some testing. You know, maybe in the lab, in vitro, where, where you check its purity, potency, stability, all those things is there developed. And when this thing fails, then you again go back to design, the discovery part, whether the antigen was right. Uh, you know, so that is a back and forth process. And once you come with a full proof design, uh, you know, when it has passed all the ASC, then you go to the Preclinical trial where you test the vaccine in small animals like mice, we take you know to testing the response. Then we take, people take also rabbit or other animals also, and uh, finally we take a monkey, which is very close to human. You know, so response in monkey after we get a promising result in mice and this thing, some people test in monkey to see that it, whether the chances of uh, it's working in human is there or not before we go into real clinical trials. Then clinical trials we call it as a real human trial where we inject the humans with the vaccine, and this uh, trial is also separated in different phases like phase one, phase two, and phase three. So if you go to the phase of clinical trial, phase one uh, is mainly trial for safety of vaccine. So we, we want to test whether the vaccine is safe or not. So that in, it involves uh, subjects which are very few numbers, like 20 to 100, and also a low risk, a category of low risk, you know, the minimum risk, because you are, your aim is to just to test the safety of vaccine, whether water formulation you have made is safe or not. So we the goal is to evaluate the safety, determine the safe dose, and identify any side effect. That is the goal of phase one. Then we, when the phase one is over and is passed, then we go to phase two, where the aim is to do safety and dosing also. The subject increase from 100 to 300 and also from low risk to high risk. Now we take a high risk individual and the goal is to define the optimal dose, the schedule of vaccine, how we give the vaccine, what doses we give, what time interval we give the vaccine and further evaluate the safety profile of vaccine. That is the year of phase two. Once it, you know, phase, phase two is over, then we go to phase three. The phase three is for safety and efficacy, where a trial subject is uh, is more in number, several thousand, and that could not localize a certain area. It could be covering different centers, you know, different areas of the country. So multicentric. 
and the goal is to provide data on safety and efficacy both that is a phase 3 trial after phase 3 trial over then uh, vaccine goes for approval and approving agency is different for different countries in india we are having a drug control general of india for approving the vaccine and usa we have a food and drug administration fda for approving so once get vaccine gets approved it can come into the market for production good company and come into the market but sometimes a phase 4 trial additional trial is also, also there some vaccine which is called as a post approval surveillance already approved but we still want to see uh, you know some kind of a, a rare events unexpected side effects you know and provide additional information on safety risk and benefit ratio all those things is for this thing you know they can be covered in large population which is already a vaccine is already taken by already approved vaccine so that is a phase 4 then if you vaccine development vaccine development is a lengthy risky and expensive process if you see this cartoon you're saying so development start with exploratory preclinical phase which is a target selection develop a vaccine then do some preclinical trials to evaluate its efficacy this may take 2 to 5 years and success rate only 40% and cost may go up 20 million us dollars okay after you get a clinical trial authorization when you go to phase of clinical trial covering all three phases phase 1 phase 2 and phase 3 each phase may cause different amount you know how large huge amount of investment is there and success may rate may also vary person also uh, you know and uh, timeline may also vary from less than a year for phase 1 two years and many years for phase 3 also and when you go to licensure and marketing you know everything will cost you time money everything and the vaccine vaccine may cost greater than 1 billion dollar also and this whole time of developing one vaccine may take up to 10 to 15 years it will cover everything you know all phases have been done very you know meticulously and you know all the side effects have been taken into account you know before giving approval so that is a very long process and you realize a very expensive process and uh, it's not tech, it's not as far realize the vaccine developer is not tech, it's not easy easy job but during a pandemic what we see when we have pandemic then these phases are are in overlapping manner you know we very quick you know, what we have seen in covid 19 lot of vaccine platform have been developed very quickly in in a exploratory clinical phase then we have also seen the phase of clinical trial which normally has been shorted short in development time you know phases have been tried because of, of the hurry you know because of this emergency situation and then we also get approval for these kind of uh, vaccines which is called approval for emergency use you know this non normal approval for other vaccines and this timeline can be reduced to 12 to 18 months what we have seen over here that is during pandemic but in this case we have compromised lot of lot of things we have you know we have not assessed lot of parameters of vaccine a potential side effect of vaccine that is a problem but when we see the benefit to uh, risk ratio the benefit is more because in the pandemic you require that kind of vaccine you could protect against when they when you want to protect against large large population so we have already seen lot of vaccines available for covid 19 which has already got uh, approval for emergency use so vaccine efficacy we come it is a percentage of reduction in disease incidence which is attributable to vaccines vaccine efficacy can be you know calculated when you uh, you know incidence in the rate in the control group you know the the one which has not received the vaccine but a placebo you know control uh then uh, minus incidence in vaccine group and divided by incidence in control uh, control group into 100 that is the percentage you get that is vaccine efficacy so in measles the current vaccine measles measles have a vaccine efficacy of ranging from 90 to 95% mumps has efficacy ranging from 72 to 88% and rubella has uh, efficacy ranging from 95 to 98% so like other medical products vaccine is also a medical product it could have a side effect and adverse event uh, you know like a, any other medicine or drug so any possible side effect resulting from vaccination is known as adverse event so this event could be very mild to moderate which is very common uh, like soreness swelling or redness at site of injection we see normally when we get a vaccine and some are maybe associated with uh, some fever rash or achiness might be there is very common with a lot of vaccine we get It's very mild. This kind of side effects are very common, uh, mild to moderate. Uh, so these serious side effects may might also be there, but they are very rare, very rare. And these side effects are may include a seizure or a life-threatening allergic reaction could be there. You know, so even some kind of death may also occur. But this is like a very rare, uh, you know, event. Now the last part is challenges. The challenges we come to you know when we vaccine. So I want to challenge. I want to cover the 200 years back when the first vaccine was developed by Edward Jenner. This cartoon shows Edward Jenner. who developed a spot pass vaccine when the concept was you know he did that landmark experiment and published a paper so he wanted to inject the vaccine to the people because the disease was very was highly prevalent and it was uh, you know causing a lot of mortality so you can see the from the cartoon that this 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 thing injecting a vaccine was not easy he has to put a lot of force and there was a lot of restraint and fear from the other people of getting the vaccine and this fear was because of the fact that people were thinking since the vaccine is derived from cow 
there could be a side effect that they might get a cow lug appendages in the you can see on the hand a cow like protrusion is there so that is the that is the fear in the in the people that they wouldn't want to get a vaccine so he has put out of force so this kind this was a some of the barrier you know uh, and uh, that is true even today also people think about side effect uh, all those thing so that was a challenge start from there now if you come to the current scenario of like we have so many challenges not only restricted to the implementation of vaccine program but challenges can also come from right from making the vaccine and then it coming to the market i discuss all challenges so first challenge is challenges pose a pathogen the pathogen you want to make a vaccine that itself can also pose pathogen so like earlier pathogens which were there i could say they were not very simple you know they were not, we, we, you know smallpox vaccine was really created because the pathogen was very simple they have not caused any mutation they didn't change with time okay but now pathogens have evolved you know they have more become more smart and they have found a strategy how to evade response how to be escape from this thing you know so there could be a strategy for pathogen to escape from response they can modify the protein structure uh, there could be antibody dependent immune enhancement which we see a lot, lot of viruses they can you know antibody generating viruses can enhance the uptake of virus by cell which can you know enhance disease also and there is high mutation rate also which we have seen for corona also covid 19 we have seen different strains like from uk strain brazil strain south africa strain all those are change strain change in mutation so the vaccine against one strain may not uh, work and against uh, other strains so that is challenge you know how can you make a vaccine which can work against all strains then there are challenges vaccine protection also where we have a challenge at level of biological you know when you prepare a vaccine you know uh, that also at the preparation sometime may be very very difficult uh, there could be a you know challenge from pharmaceutical level where uh, after preparation you know formulation in the, to make it to ready to use product like in the market there could also be a lot of issues the toxicity and all those thing which could you know a lot of hurdles are there where you face a challenge then sometimes some vaccines take long time to to, to get produced like uh, you know tetanus take 9 10 months for production diphtheria vaccine takes 11 months for production then there is also a rigorous very rigorous quality check for vaccine especially for cover companies to, to ensure that vaccine is really safe and there is not any kind of issue in the vaccine that will also is challenge you know a lot of batches they have to throw away, away if they found the quality is not good uh, toxicity is one of the uh, very challenge affordability is also a challenge you know how to make a vaccine very cost effective very cheap that is one of even of technology advancement still it is a challenge that how can we make a vaccine which should be very very cost effective which can be afforded by the poor then vaccine testing also it is a also challenge that how can we shorten timeline that is discuss the vaccine normal vaccine development may take 5 10 years 15 years also some vaccine may take for development you know but how can we shorten this timeline to 1 to 2 years that is a, that is a challenge you know that's one challenge toxicity and doses that also become in, in in the testing period that could become a challenge then the challenge in vaccine supply and various immunization like misconception we have missing people like still in villages we have people who do not want to take vaccine especially corona also we have seen a lot of villages people have a misconception that uh, that vaccine can, can cause infertility or some other kind of uh, problems uh, you know they, they do not want to take vaccine so those, those kind of misconception may also prevent people from taking vaccine and become a challenge then we have inconvenience sometimes time transport lack of expert system to take a vaccine you know clinics get cancelled uh booster doses people, people people take a vaccine but don't come for booster doses they forget the dose when the next dose is there so that the vaccine will not have any effect it will get wasted so that kind of challenges is there you know to make a successful vaccination program uh, the barriers challenges are also there during implementation and during making the vaccine all those challenges you know if you consider then definitely this process is really challenging to uh, to get a successful vaccine now what is the ideal vaccine ideal vaccine uh, you can we can think of what are the features a vaccine should have which a what a vaccine should have which i can think of it could i would say it is easy to define but very difficult to achieve the, those targets uh, what a vaccine i have discussed till now i have gone to the different kind of vaccine you have seen i have talked about both advantages and limitations so everything has limitations okay it is not that you can get a perfect thing but you can always make a criteria you can always make a thing you know that this is the kind of vaccine i want what are the features in vaccine you are looking for so first thing is that you want a vaccine which could get give you a long life immunity you know i am showing you the card with one shield we are seeing the shield is for protection but with time the shield is you know breaking and you know becoming weak and you know and you have you know that way means the protection you achieved in the childhood with the vaccine you cannot get the same level of protection in your adulthood because the vaccine with time uh, you know the response has gone down it is not maintained so we need a vaccine which can maintain response for longer time that's for sure okay second thing is that we want to need a, a vaccine which can single vaccine protect against all variants what we have seen for sars cov2 also 
it can produce a protect against all variants. Then it can also reduce induce uh, rapid immunity. It could induce a very rapid uh, antibody and T cell response uh, that is there. It could transmit the material protection to fetus. Antibody, you know, that is also one of the criteria for a good vaccine, ideal vaccine. Then it should not prevent disease from transmission. You know, uh, you know, vaccine we have given. So it should uh, the person should uh, who getting vaccine if you get disease should not be able to transmit disease to other person. It should the vaccine should be single shot. We, we don't want a booster. So if one, once you have got a shot, vaccine should induce immunity for long, lifelong or for, for, life, for longer time. No booster required. It should be effective in all people, our subjects, like the person, like the vaccine for a young person should be the same vaccine to be given to the old also. And it should be effective against those old, old also. It should be less invasive. The vaccine can be given orally, no injection. It should be stable. It should not require special storage condition like very low temperature and all those things. And it should not cause any toxicity toxicity you know uh, in uh, at local or systemic and it should be cost effective you know it should be cheap that is the ideal vaccine if you go to the cause of the vaccine failure vaccine usually uh, when fail when you use expired vaccine you know vaccine usually expired uh, a vaccine may also fail when you the person who is uh, getting a vaccine is a poor nutrition and health is not good so a healthy person can only take a vaccine if you want to get a good response then vaccine could also be due to the effect, due to the, the problem in antigen preparation. There might be poor antigenicity that could lead to the vaccine failure. There could be a, a you know water deprivation and heat stress. You know could also lead to the you know vaccine will not work in the people who are already uh, dehydrated. You know and under the heat stress, there could be some administration error also. You know you go to for a vaccine to for injection, but the person who is injecting the vaccine he might also make error. The amount of dose required for getting an immune response. Uh, you know, he may inject uh, maybe lesser amount or maybe not, no, whatever, you know, so there could be some errors on that side also, which could lead to vaccine failure. There could be a poor batch quality for particular vaccine lot, company make a uh, vaccine and there's always variation lot to lot. So that poor quality of particular lot, uh, that's why batch testing is required and that can also lead to the vaccine failure. Then a person who is on immunosuppression or due to drugs can also will not get a good response from vaccine. There could also be genetic resistance and variability, the Europeans response will be different from Africans. Uh, response so this is the genetic variability and temperature and the place they are getting vaccine the environment all those things will contribute to immune response and the effect of vaccine then in proper storage conditions if you don't properly store the uh, vaccine whatever is recommended then vaccine will not show that effect what is intended to then there could be vaccine reactions severe reactions which could also lead to vaccine failure so in spite of those things, uh, you know, vaccine, there are a lot of success stories that I've seen that I can not tell you. This is old data, but you can see in diphtheria in 1921, we have around 2 lakh cases in the US, but it was 2007, it was zero. Nothing was there. Same way, a lot of cases have been reduced for other diseases also, like polio eradicated. So we can see that a lot of disease has been eradicated or cases have been reduced. So vaccine definitely had a, you know, great impact on the people's health. And it has a very good, uh, you know, great impact on that thing. But success takes time. You know, you can see the typhoid vaccine, you took 105 years to develop a typhoid vaccine. First, I understand the technology was not that much and the people were not knowing what disease also. But with time, you know, still people took, uh, it took longer time for other diseases also. But there's a challenge that in spite of more than 25 years are over, we still don't have a vaccine for HIV. You know, some of the uh, virus bacteria are really challenging. So it's like, you know, not, not easy to make a vaccine. In spite of passing so many years, so much funding has been given, so much effort is put, put by scientists all over the world. We still have, we don't have a very good vaccine for a lot of diseases. So that means uh, we get a success. It takes time, but sometimes it could be challenging also. We have to also realize that part. Thank you very much. I, I will be happy to take any questions. Uh, sir, may I have a question? Yes, sure, sure. I'm Dr. J.K. Shivastha, uh, Director, MT Institute of Biotechnology, Lucknow Campus. Uh, my question is... Stop. Uh, yes. Should I continue? Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Okay, okay, sir. So, my question is first that you have told about the reverse vaccinology where the uh, through the uh, bioinformatics tool, we can segregate, we can uh, screen out the lot of uh, epitopes which are uh, non reactive, non active, and finally we can narrow down. Yes. So that is a approach through bioinformatics. Do you have any experience or any uh, um, information that during this process we have lost some very potential antigens that may happen or that 
uh, means that our tools are so much strong and robust that it is not possible or it is possible so it's a very good question for swasto because i think uh, that's what because i am not a mathematician but this question is always in my mind because even i am working in that area i am not a mathematician but i am collaborating with someone who is and we have for our disease also we have did this uh, thing and we have came up with some target some like you see how many like 300 proteins were there and out of and we have compared so many genomes also and finally he came out to six proteins yes. so i am very surprised six looks very good number to be tested so testing is going on but that's what my question is still there i don't know or i may not be sure it worked very well for the first disease meningitis men b which was developed by the ronnie poli but uh, i think there is no other vaccine based on this thing till now people are still doing it yeah. uh, but there i also believe there could be possibility that we could miss out some important proteins and uh, whatever software we are having it that mm -hmm. is just a prediction so how right. full proof they are that is something need to be seen with with time I, i would say that i would not say i would not say that this is a, because uh, what i believe is that you can predict anything but right. what is going in the body is a real thing until you, unless you test it you cannot say that is a really good vaccine candidate right testing is required so i i think this is a very very good question i think we have to wait uh, we have to see time will tell i can't tell you at this moment that really okay. but i uh, i also feel like that sir same <laughs> yeah, yeah i also feel i also feel i, I agree, totally agree with you i have this thing yes. so i don't have much hope because definitely testing will tell us and how software how my how, second, how, second how, question will be uh, it's a very current scenario in covid situation the covid vaccine initially it was recommended that the booster can be given after four weeks and we know that after three and four weeks the secondary response can be raised after hmm. giving the booster but hmm. later on it enhances for eight weeks and currently it is for 12 weeks so what is this logic behind that means there is any experimental proof See, in... i would say i i would talk in both terms in terms of experiment also some kind what is the requirement of this thing see this covid thing came as a as a something which was which no one was prepared for okay yes. so it was like something which was we are seeing a pandemic after long, i mean i would say about almost 100 years yeah yeah we have no but it was something with, in in a time when we had a lot of technologies available we are more technology advanced we understand everything so i think we are not prepared for that thing so you can see like all, all the country they were a little behind it making the vaccine different kind mm -hmm. of vaccines have been made different platforms okay and uh, you know the amount of vaccine demand demand was very much than the than the this thing uh, what you call demand than the than the water supply we are having it yeah. demand was more so that that was biggest challenge for every government what is thing you know people need vaccine we don't have vaccine and vaccine cannot be made overnight that is the process is there even if you if you put all resources what infrastructure you are having it so i would talk in both ways that maybe a study was done where we found that it's it is sometime possible that you know when you when you uh, uh, make uh, do a more gap give more time for it is thing you get a better response that is there but it also it is there that when you have to fulfill a demand for this thing then you know it can be also be you know it could be more political also where you know you can increase the gap uh, to see that vaccine is available for everyone there is no not much uh this kind of a problem is there where people are demanding vaccine at time is already there for the booster so if we yeah. keep a short in time then everyone will demand a booster how will we the government will or fulfill that so that is was the idea i think both ways it was there i would say it was also a experimental validation where uh, in i think study was done in us and uk where they have found that if you do a larger gap for this case vaccine was giving better response there okay and i think additional thing was there given because of this thing the challenge of uh, you know supplying with the demand supply demand was very high yes. time was very less all efforts have been put so that is also one of the reason so i would say both things okay thank you sir and my last question uh, if you have if you permit me jay yeah, social sure, sure. yes sir you are very senior to me professor also should not like, you know i have respect for you anyway uh, since we know that uh, we are having the successful vaccines for uh, bacteria for viruses but we are lacking in the developing a vaccine for helminth parasites yeah uh filaria which is a very uh, uh, big issue for the who also and uh, we are working on filaria since ages but still we are not having any uh, successful uh, preparation for our, for the vaccination purpose so 
can you can you give some idea that what is the issue yeah uh, sir what i can say is that because i don't work for parasite i am i'm talking bacteria if it don't work so what i can say is that definitely parasite vaccine is very very really challenging i can understand in our institute uh, i have a scientist colleague dr paresh sharma who is working on thaleria is that i develop a vaccine and uh, new therapeutics for for uh, this uh, thaleria parasite so i think if he would have been there he would have given you much much clearer picture about this thing but i understand as compared to bacteria and uh, vi this virus thaleria is more challenging so that could be one reason why you know we are lacking but i can't comment very clearly because i am not from that field sorry for this thing okay. i don't know much about uh, you know okay. okay no issue sir thank you very much thank you thank you thank you thank you sir you are from where lucknow yes which place lucknow uh, i was in cdri oh okay okay nice. i i was from lucknow right i am uh, currently i am in amity institute biotechnology earlier i was in cdri uh, my phd i did my phd from there acha acha okay okay uh, and helminthic infections and my subsequent reaction, research was on dishmaniasis okay 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 i i i cdri is a very good work for there what there Yes. So, yeah, yeah. Nice meeting you. Thank you, Dr. Abhijit. Hello. Any other question? Okay, uh, Dr. Faisal. Thank you so much for your interesting uh, presentation. I'm Dr. Sandeep here. Yeah. Sorry, there is nobody is around here, so I am trying to coordinate. You know. Okay, okay. You are not okay, the. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know. <laughs> so a wonderful talk, uh, Faisal. I also have a question, if uh, you don't mind me asking. I will. I will. You know. You can. Why? Why? So I know the answer or not? Question should no, be asked. No, no, I mean just very generally. You know, I'm just ah. asking because see, I'm not yeah. into. I'm from reproduction side, so I'm just curious. You know, as uh, Doctor uh, Shrivastava just asked this question ah, he about asked this. Good, very good question, Doctor Shrivastava. Yeah. so you know uh, since uh, you know co vaccine and covi shield are these two vaccine key player in our country you know and uh, covi co vaccine uh, is a very conventional vaccine which has been time tested you know for several hundred of years we have been having this kind of vaccine and uh, you know the time gap between the booster also is is constantly been kept as 28 days you know Mm. do you think that uh, you know and and for the covi shield you know they have been uh, you know shifting it from uh, you know 8 weeks to 12 weeks now 16 weeks and all that and you already answered that question that you know maybe that has a reason but do, uh, do you think that uh, uh, the for co vaccine if you are uh, increasing the gap between the booster would it be more beneficial also i'm just curious you know i mean so, uh, compared to Yeah, yeah. So that's a very good question. Let me tell you. See, the uh, co vaccine and uh, the COVID shield. Mm -hmm. These two vaccines are two different platform. Okay. Co vaccine yeah. is a shield vaccine. Yeah, yeah. And COVID mm -hmm. shield is is attenuated vaccine. Mm -hmm. In COVID shield, what they have done, they have taken a viral vector, a virus mm -hmm. which normally don't infect human adenovirus. Right, right. And put the spike protein gene over there. Okay. So I, as I told in my talk also that in 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 a in a this. Uh, attenuated vaccine you have advantage that vaccine antigen will be available for longer time because it is attenuated it is keep on mm. expressing you know mm -hmm. but killed vaccine you know since the bacteria or virus is killed it will mm. be cleared from body very very easily you know very okay, very fast okay. so response okay. will when see you see body will only produce antibodies when it finds antigen when there is no okay. antigen it will the response will come down mm -hmm. you know that is the reason so that the advantage they could uh, increase the gap of covid shield only because it was made on that platform mm -hmm. and Only thing because they are knowing that vaccine antigen will be available. It is there. Only booster will give you uh, enhancement of this thing. So they had an advantage. But if you yeah. if you do this thing, uh, uh, you know, increase the gap of of co vaccine. Definitely in the twenty mm. eight days they they have seen that the response has come down, antibody has come down, memory has been formed. They give a booster. Mm -hmm. but, but if you if you give it. It increases the gap. The chances be there. We don't don't know how memory will be formed. If you increase mm. too long, then that the second dose will also be caused not as booster, but as a first dose. That is Achha, there. Achha, so, so if we reduce, they got only because of the platform. Acha, if we reduce the timing, like if we do it for three weeks instead of four, I mean, would it be? So timing, reducing timing is usually not recommended because you know you you give some time for vaccine. You know when mm. you inject the vaccine, you give some time to 
uh, mm. give cells get activated and all those possible no no that's okay but how do they come to 28 days as the ideal time you know that's the question why cannot it be 20 See, 28 days is not a timing which which uh, they have come for this vaccine it is, uh, it's, it's a, a generally for vaccine most vaccine. vaccine yeah it is like there which is like okay. this 21 28 days period is there which is from other vaccine where people have acha 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 okay so for this vaccine and right. it usually this time period only when they monitor the antibody antibody is formed and when you see level has dropped down you give a booster so that is so. kind of a monitoring they might have done in a, in a clinical trial data from okay. there data right. from clinical trial will only let you to make a schedule how when do you need to give vaccine this all from clinical right. trial right right okay dr fazal thank you so much so thank you, thank you very much there are any other question from the audience here any student or any other teachers who are attending before we wind up we would like to give an opportunity to ask question to dr fazal he gave a very wonderful talk and dr fazal actually runs a lab uh, uh, in nib and he is also looking for potential phd candidates who are extremely dedicated and focused to do work in his lab his specialization is in leptospirosis so please uh, if you are interested you can visit his website and try to know about his work okay so if there are no further question uh, thank you dr fazal uh, bappa is there bappa might like to uh, yes yes so uh, dr fazal i have a uh, question that actually sometimes runs through my mind is uh, as uh, yeah. as an infectious disease person and infectious specialist globally everybody knows that doctor saab aap us field ke vaccines is the ultimate answer to tackle any of these infectious diseases but if you look at the research funding um, uh, although globally there is a lot of research in vaccines especially in india number of people who are working towards developing vaccines either it is bacterial viral or parasitic diseases is minuscule so uh, what is this thought behind um, means policy makers uh, that why more funding is not put into vaccine development rather than all other kind of research because ultimately the whole society is now understanding how much it is needed to develop better vaccine good vaccines to prevent all the suffering that we are going through it is time possibly uh, policy makers look into this fact what is your comment on this so that day that is that is very good question i think that is question also in my mind so what i can tell you from current scenario how the world is moving i can tell that you know what wherever you are investing you want a you know get back how quickly you can get back so investment in a drug the chances of getting back is much quicker as compared to vaccine because vaccine is a thing which is not only time consuming there is chances of failure also you know lot of things are there which are, you know so and uh, if you see that uh, in i now i think the the vaccine which has been developed earlier earlier time that we are very you know developed and be very effective also but the parison were very simple also now parison have become more complicated and uh, if you see the investment involved in making a vaccine and output you are getting that is one reason i could see that why people are like not investing and then they have seen a cases where uh, you know scientists around the world struggled for making a good vaccine for uh, as a replacement for bcg for mycobacterium but we didn't get any, any good vaccine out of that also is part of so research is something which scientists only realize that how difficult it is you cannot anticipate always a positive thing so those kind of risk you know sometimes government don't want to take and uh, i think that could be i, I can think of it's it is it's a risk and benefit kind of thing i i think that now covid pandemic has changed a lot of things you know uh, covid pandemic i feel that has realized the importance of vaccine so at least the government will think of i think now they will think of spending in this area and giving that kind of a you know budget for this area that's very much required i agree with you but this th has been there during this time period only because i think uh because this some reasons uh, i i i can understand what from what i feel but i hope for a positive i think you, you are right that we really require a good uh, funding for this uh, area uh, so that you know a lot of diseases are there which we need a vaccine and we don't have okay uh, dr goel you can conclude the meeting okay so um, uh, if there are no further question from for dr fazal um, i would like to thank all the participants to uh, for attending this wonderful talk and uh, i would like to thank dr fazal for such an 
uh, enlightening and uh, you know uh, informative talk i mean certain things that uh, you know i also learned something new today thank you very much sir thank you for appreciating <laughs> I, I, i would like to thank the organizers of the uh, organizers of this uh, science city program dr goel dr bappa ji today dr abhijit everyone i want to thank you because they have arranged very well there was no interruption it went very smoothly so thank you very much from my side also yeah you should also thank the the bioinformatic yeah, director director and all the staff yeah yeah nay yeah. and the bioinformatic for continuous supply yeah. of internet without yeah. interruption so thanks to bioinformatics dr sailesh sharma <laughs> right right okay so thank you very much everybody we hope uh, to see you tomorrow again there is a talk uh, by uh, dr shobik sen sharma so the link we shared with you uh, probably soon so we'd like to see you there also thank you very much everybody you. and have a wonderful day thank, thank you, you. bye